please the bill you take uh, from here. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to talk about uh, CMake, and these are CMake, modern CMake is an open source set of tools to build, test, and package software. Um, there's something called CMake, which is the build tool, CTest for testing, and CPack for packaging, and then a web application called CDash. So, quick, go ahead, the introduction. Um, one of the founders of Kitware originated the CMake build tool. Um, I like to run around the, the mountains barefoot or in sandals. Um, all right, moving on, I'm going to try to get through these introductory slides pretty quick so people can have time for questions and I can cover a lot of the uh, topics on CMake. Um, first, a quick introduction to Kitware for those that aren't familiar with it um, or maybe all of it. Um, Kitware, we do collaborative uh, R&D software. Um, we create a algorithms and applications. We help people develop software processes and infrastructure. Um, we have this sort of wheel chart here. Um, we have a high performance computing and visualization group. They're the ones that uh, you know, worked on Paraview, which is uh, probably common in your community. Um, the medical computing group, um, which their main open source platform is ITK and Slicer. We have a computer vision group. They do a lot of work with uh, DARPA and um, tracking and videos. We also have a data and analytics group that create uh, web applications for data and analytics. Um, and then we have a software process group, which is the group that works with uh, CMake and CDash and CTest and the stuff I'll be talking about today. Um, we work with uh, all kinds of uh, customers and collaborators, um, academic institutions, government labs, and lots of companies. Um, we support open source platforms. Our business model is to build these platforms <laughs> and then provide support or do collaborative research based on these platforms to, uh, and, and always with an eye to, to make the platforms better and, and work on them into the future. So there's VTK and Paraview, um, ITK and Slicer, CMake, which I'll be talking a lot about, Resonant for informatics and infoviz. Um, Quiver is a toolkit from our computer vision group for uh, image and video analysis. Um, we also have some other areas in simulation, ultrasound physiology, information security, material science. So what is CMake? Um, CMake is a cross-platform open source build system that lets you use the native development tools you love the most. Or maybe the next build tool that comes out that's really cool. Um, so it's a build system generator. It doesn't actually do the build. It generates to different types of builds. So it can um, work with uh, Ninja, Visual Studio, Xcode, make files. Um, the input is plain text input files where you describe your project and then it produces project files or make files for use of wide variety of native development tools. So I always kind of thought of it as being able to uh, take advantage of the most precious resource of the project, which is the developer. And if Kitware is any indication of what developers like, um, they all like different tools. Um, and they use different tools, and they're most productive using the tools they like. So if you take someone that likes an IDE, force them to use the command line, um, they may not be as productive, and they'll, they'll complain about the build tool. But CMake allows a wide variety of developers and them to use the tools they like and to be more productive in that way. And along with that, I mean, not just building, but we had to build CMake so that it was able to test your software and also package it. Uh, modern CMake. So this is just a quick introduction to that. I'll get into it a little bit deeper, but since the title of the talk was Modern CMake, I thought I'd dive right in. Um, some key points. CMake is code. It should be treated like that. Um, the CMake lists, um, you know, they should have comments and they should follow good uh, programming standards, just like you would for the rest of your code base. Another key point is that CMake targets are objects with public and private properties. Um, targets being libraries or executables, mostly libraries. 
Um, next point is that third-party libraries should be imported as targets. Um, repeating that object pattern. The library should know what flags it needs to be if you want to consume that library. And that you should export your libraries so that others can use them in CMake projects. A little history of CMake. <coughs> To give a, a shout out to uh, where it got created from. So the uh, Visible Human Project was created by the National Library of Medicine. And in 94, 95, they created a data set that they made public. Uh, it was a CT, MR, and then they actually took the bodies and froze them and sliced them and took pictures at each slice. So they created this really interesting data set where you had ground truth data on CT and MR scans. But then they came with the revolutionary idea, I think, that um, really to make science move forward, you had to take the code that worked with that type of data and actually implement it and make it open source um, to avoid the, uh, what I like to say, you know, you have a PhD professor and he's got a student and he hand student a paper and says, you know, go off and implement this, see how it, see how well it works on this data set. And then student comes back and says, well, it didn't work. You know, and they, maybe they spent a month on it. And did the student implement it wrong? Was the paper wrong? There's all kinds of variables there. But if you actually have the code, then you can run it and, and find that out. And then, so the idea is there a code. So Kitware was part of the team. There were uh, three commercial entities and three academic institutions that were tasked with creating ITK. Kitware was one of the lead engineering teams. And we were basically tasked with making it build on Windows, uh, Unix, and Apple. Um, we weren't exactly tasked with creating a build tool. But at the end of the day, that's what we did with CMake. Um, and in 2001, CMake was uh, created um, and had its first release branch. Um, since then, CMake has uh, gotten broad usage in the C++ world. I suppose our, our big tipping point was in 2006 when KDE adopted it as their build tool. And this was good for them and, and great for us as well um, in that it forced CMake to adopt a lot of standard uh, patterns that you see in, uh, that were in auto tools and that to make uh, shared library versioning work and install rules work fast. Um, so basically, it was a great opportunity for a, a large toolkit to adopt CMake that was outside of the Kitware's project. Um, and since then, you can, uh, like, uh, if you went on Indeed.com today and searched for jobs that had CMake in the requirement, I think there's like 263 of them right now, and a lot of big, big projects use it. Um, we get about 7K downloads per day from our website, but it's also packaged with uh, other systems. Um, Microsoft adopted it. I mean, this is this is really crazy. I, I figured any time they were going to, at some point, they were going to come try to sue us for uh, reverse engineering their Visual Studio files, or at least have us committed to a mental institution for reverse engineering them. Um, but instead, they've they've adopted it, and CMake actually ships with the latest version of Visual Studio, and they're working with us to uh, further that integration. CMake features that uh, I think this group will be in, in particularly interested in that CMake does automatic dependency generation. You know, if you write your own make files, that's often hard to do. Um, in that, you know, include files are automatically done with C and C++, um, CUDA, and also Fortran. Um, so CMake has a built-in Fortran parser and makes sure that everything's up to date and that things are built in the right order. So if you build a target in some directory, everything in that target depends on will be up to date. If a header file changes, the correct files will be, will be built. And you really don't have to do much work to make that happen. <coughs> so Fortran module order, this is a, a difficult thing for uh, build systems to get right. This was from uh, Intel uh, Fortran user's guide. Um, you need to make sure the module files are created before they are referenced by another program or subprogram. Okay, well, how do you do that? Um, I've heard some of the old way was people just type make, 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 make until it actually works, um, which obviously is sort of a pain in the neck. 
with CMake, you can write CMake and then make, or CMake and Ninja, or CMake and CMake dash dash build. And then CMake will make sure that the Fortran files in that directory are ordered in the correct order so that the modules are all built and created before they're referenced in another, in another Fortran file. Um, the Ninja build tool. This is, uh, I think, one of the great examples of uh, how CMake's community works and, and how we can move forward. So Ninja was a tool created by the folks at Google to build Chrome faster. And as soon as it got released as open source, I think within a week or so, there was a, a version that, that worked with CMake. Someone had started putting a, uh, a merge request on CMake. And I think within a couple months, we had it pretty well working on uh, Windows, Linux, and Mac, um, and all the platforms. Um, so that, that was a great, great example. So then any project that was using CMake automatically now is able to use this much faster uh, parallel build tool called Ninja. Um, we also improved the parallelism for Ninja um, as of CMake 3.9 um, by what used to happen is each, with each target, it would build all the .o files um, in parallel, but then it would stop on the link and it wouldn't do any other object files until that link was actually done. Um, in newer CMake, it's able to uh, build all the .o files because they don't really depend, unless there's hard dependencies on those, those libraries specified, and then, and then link when it needs to. Um, you can also control, use uh, pools to limit concurrent links if, if that's causing a, a problem for your system, if it has too, many, too much memory being used. Um, another random thing that CMake does really well, it's got really good install commands that work cross-platform, packaging tools, the ability to find and link system libraries, handles shared library versions across platforms, <clears throat> keeps up to date with uh, your favorite compilers and some really strange ones. It uh, promotes cross-platform development, um, integration of static and dynamic analysis tools, um, coverage tools. Um, we have great policy system um, for backwards compatibility. So CMake tries really hard to not break your code. Um, but nudge you forward by giving you some warnings if uh, we've found better ways to do things. Um, it's an open and dynamic community accepting uh, changes large and small, and it supports many workflows and IDs. Um, the basic workflow is you run, you edit your files in your source tree, you run CMake or a C, one of the CMake GUIs, and this creates a build tree, and then you open the projects and use the build tree and really, you only need to run CMake once to create this build tree, because CMake will put hooks for itself in, in that build tree. And if any of the input to CMake changes, it'll make sure that that gets updated. Um, one of the things that uh, CMake does really well is out-of-source builds. Um, I remember early on, I mean, way back in the 90s when I was doing make files and, and autoconf, it kind of did this, but you had to go through a lot of hoops to make it work. Um, this is sort of the norm for CMake, and it's really neat because you can have your source tree, one source tree, and then you can run CMake several times creating different build trees where you can try different things, maybe different build generators, uh, maybe different optimization levels, maybe different compilers, um, and these can all use that same source tree but have completely different build trees. So modern CMake. Um, here's a sort of a, a list of what CMake can look like uh, and used to look like. So this is the earliest CMake list file I could find. Um, it was from 2001. Um, and you can see it, it's changed a lot. Um, basically, it was sort of declarative and it looked a lot like a make file um, way back then. In 2008, you did something along the lines of this. Um, but you were using uh, you know, variables for sources. Um, and, and now you have this more object-oriented CMake where uh, you're, you basically you create a library and then you're telling it what sources. And then I can say, you know, if I'm on Windows, I want to add this extra source file um, instead of having to use uh, variables that, you know, if you misspelled them or something, it wouldn't uh, necessarily know what to do. But in this case, the target name has to exist uh, or you'll actually get a hard error. 
Um, the best way to think about modern CMake is that targets are your objects. Um, so you have a library, and the constructor would be an add library call. And then you can set the uh, compile definitions, compile features. These would be sort of like the member functions on your object. Um, and the same thing for an executable. And then the actual properties themselves would be the member variables. But the idea is that you encapsulate this in the target. So the developer only needs to focus on the single target and not the whole system. You know, what include directories will the user need when they link compile against my code? What minus D flags will the user need when they compile against my code? What compile flags does the user need when they compile against my code? What version of C++ is the user going to be required to use with this library? What flags and options will users not need? Um, and, but maybe I need to build. Um, and these can be controlled with public and private declarations. But if you take anything away from uh, this talk, this, this slide's uh, pretty important. The, the fact that you want to take that single target and program to that and then use it elsewhere and then the, all this stuff just sort of propagates. Um, and you're using uh, basically the target. The classic style, you would have said something like include directories and then targets in this directory and subdirectories get that include flag. But then if you move something out of a directory over to somewhere else, then this breaks. Um, so what people end up doing is just keep pushing those include directories up to the top of their project, and then they've got just huge command lines that are, that are ridiculous um, and use way more flags than they need to um, to build the code. Whereas with modern CMake, you're only going to get what you need or what the developer thinks you need. And that developer only needs to think of a small object at a time, which is that one library. Um, before usage requirements, um, the commands you would say, you know, include directories, compile definitions, compile options, and they would inherit down. Um, the consumers needed to know, you know, does the dependency generate build tree files? Does the dependency use any new external package? Um, so there's, there was lots of things that you had to know. Um, in modern CMake, the goal is to have each target fully describe how to properly use it. Um, no difference between internal and external targets. Um, so the layout is independent. You can have it anyway. Really what you want is this, this graph right here where the executable uses library B and library A, um, and then library B uses library A. That's fine. And then all the flags and compile options, link options just work. And it doesn't matter what your uh, actual directory layout looks like. So mostly, uh, modern C makes about not using these commands. You know, add, compile, anything that affects like a whole directory and down. Um, and then treating the targets like objects. Um, the usage requirements, target link libraries is the foundation of the usage requirements. Um, and it's formed by public, private, and interface. Um, target include directories, this uh, propagates include directories. So this one, um, I'm saying my uh, interface to uh, leaf would link to uh, the zlib directory. Um, anything that links to leaf will automatically have the zlib dir in, in the include line. Um, compile options, I can propagate compiler options. Um, in this case, I'm saying private. So only trunk, the trunk object is, or files in there are going to be optimized for the current hardware. Anything that links to trunk will not get this flag. Um, compile definitions, so this one I'm saying public. Um, so root will have root version defined, and anything that links to root will also have root version defined. Um, interface libraries are a target that um, doesn't create any build output, so it may have properties set upon it, and it may be installed, exported, and imported. Um, so you could use it for something like uh, turning on C++ uh, 11, or you could use it for header file only libraries. Um, along the lines of this, importing and exporting of targets is something that's uh, important in keeping with this targets as objects. So in this case, I'm going to create an imported target um, where I create an add library 
um, static imported. I set the property, um, the target. I'm setting the uh, imported location using the uh, set property on the target map. And the ad library there essentially constructed a library called map. And then down here, I'm link using that in a trunk, I'm linking to math. So in, in this case, it looks like a regular CMake target. So it's really indistinguishable from something that was built in your system, which is not the way CMake used to be, but the way it is now. Um, you can also do um, per configuration import rules. Um, which is better than the optimized debug keywords in uh, target link libraries. Um, in this case, I'm going to find a, uh, a debug library for math and a release library for math. I'm going to create one thing, one target called math, and then I'm going to set the import location to math release and the import location debug to math debug. And then I link trunk to math. But I'm not right at that point I don't the person using math doesn't have, doesn't even know if there's a debug or a release version. They just know that they want to link to math. But yet when I compile this, if I'm building debug or release, it'll build the right version. So install rules, you can export targets out of CMake. Um, install rules can generate um, imported targets. So if I have a uh, library and I do install um, install these targets, um, the destination libtree export libtree targets, and then I do install export tree targets destination libtree. This installs library and target import rules. So the the library is going to be in prefix libtree libparasite.a, and then in prefix lib cmake tree, there's going to be tree-targets.cmake. And that's where that it's going to do an add library, um, and add an imported library. And then someone finding that package can just load that into their cmake file and then use that library, Parasite, as if it was built as part of their system. Conditional includes. So you can specify include directories. Um, if we are building a library or using the installed version, um, this is pretty important to know. So when you're building your software, your uh, include directory is going to be somewhere in your source tree, obviously. But after you install it, you're going to want to put it in the install prefix include package and you can see right there it's using a what's called a generator expression and these, that's the dollar angle bracket and this allows cmake to expand those variables out when it's in its generate phase if you remember to go back to the slide of what cmake process is it, it configures so you hit configure it basically executes all the cmake code and then you hit generate and generate actually creates your make files or your Visual Studio files or whatever your build tools are, your Ninja files, and it creates those. And during that creation process, that's when these generate things get expanded. Um, generating the export package. Um, this is constructing components need for CMake Aware config package. CMake package config helper. Um, can help with the generation of your uh, name config.cmake file. Exporting of find package calls um, has to be replicated inside the uh, name config, but the cmake find dependency macro helps simplify that. So it's, we've got tools there to help you export your libraries so that other people can use your libraries if you're building with cmake. So you'd include the uh, cmake package config helper and then call this function configure package config file um, to take a uh, config.cmake.in and go 
right into some install directory, and then that would create something that looks like this. Um, exporting targets. So I can create a library. Um, I can set the uh, properties of the uh, interface include directories. Um, and I'm setting the uh, compile definitions. The export data is what it looks like. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. This is what the, the exported target looks like. Thank you. Thank you. So the three targets that C make. This gets generated for you. Okay, install rules. So CMake has a great cross-platform install ability. Um, specify rules to run at uh, install time. So I'm just creating a library here, and then I want to install some targets. And I'm giving a runtime destination and a library and an archive destination. Um, to install, you can install just files. You give a list of files and then uh, a destination. And that's going to be relative to the install path. Using config modules, find package supports CMake config modules um, that are generated. We just went through that. Um, and the find package can, can find those or use find modules. Um, CMake scripts. CMake minus E um, command. This is just a crops platform utility for copying files, removing files, just a couple of common things that, to keep your uh, either custom cams or CMake uh, code from having uh, operating system specific calls in it. You really want to avoid that if you want it to work cross-platform. Um, CMake minus P script, these are uh, cross-platform scripting utility. It doesn't generate any of the build stuff like the cache. Um, and ignores all the commands specific to generating the build environment, um, but you can still run small scripts. CMake also supports object libraries. Um, and what this means is instead of building to a uh, shared library or a static library, you just create the .o files or .obj files. And then when you uh, link against them, you can see down here it links just the .o files. So I've got my, uh, I'm creating, I'm linking leaf, and you can see that it links in root.cxx.o and trunk.cxx.o. Um, even though those were called libraries, but they're object libraries. Um, this can be useful if you want to, uh, for various uh, applications, if you don't want to uh, have to create system level libraries around groups of uh, related objects. Okay, moving on to uh, testing. So uh, automatic testing is obviously beneficial. I've got this slide. I've been showing it for a while. Um, the uh, idea of the slide is that if you have automated testing, your actual time spent testing is uh, reduced quite a bit. Um, although what usually happens is people just don't test if they don't have automated testing. So the time spent is probably the same, but the code quality goes down. Here's an example of uh, Paraview being tested with ctest minus J8 on a Windows box. And each one of these is a separate test going up. Um, Paraview is going through, uh, I think it's using a, a library. We've got like QT test um, that allows you to save scripts out. And then it'll actually grab the uh, image and do image differences and make sure that it's getting the expected image. Um, testing with CMake is really easy. Um, basically, it needs to be enabled by calling include test or enable testing. And then you can uh, just call add test with a name and then the uh, command that you want it to run. Executables should return zero for a test that passes. You can also set up uh, regular expressions if you, if you don't want to depend on the return value. Um, CTest is an executable that's distributed with CMake that can run the tests in a project. And then uh, I'll talk about C dash a little bit later as well. Um, so CTest, so if I just run CTest at the top of a binary directory, it will run all the tests in, in that project um, and give you a little report um, and show you how, how each one was run. 
The minus J option allows you to run tests in parallel, um, and you can give it minus JN to specify how many. Like that example I showed of the, the multiple pair views running. The minus R option is a regular expression that allows you to choose a test, so it's best to name your tests um, appropriately so that you can group them. Um, you can also apply labels to them, and there's minus L label option. Um, running tests from make files or projects, you can type make test or build run test project in Windows. Ctest minus minus help would give you more information. Um, it also supports uh, integrate, integration of Google test um, with the ability to discover the test. Um, this is new in CMake 310. Um, it essentially uh, asks the test executable to list its tests and then find some new tests without having to rerun CMake. Um, CMake also supports some uh, interesting static analysis tools. I think uh, with the advent of uh, Clang, we're starting to see a lot of uh, really interesting things coming out because you actually have a, a library with you know, the whole C++ language behind it, and people are creating interesting tools for doing checks. <coughs> for example, there's uh, include what you use, um, which will, flat, will go through your code and make sure they each include file is actually necessary. And CMake's got a built-in way of uh, running and include what you use. Um, we also uh, create something called link what you use, um, which only works on Linux, but is pretty handy if you, if you think you've gotten out of hand with uh, linking too many libraries into an executable. But of course, with modern CMake, you know, each target would only use and export what it needs, and that wouldn't be a problem. Um, there's uh, Clang Tidy, uh, CPP Lint, and CPP Check. Um, there's some setup instructions available on this uh, blog I did a while ago on the Kitware blog. So what's C Dash? So the idea is this uh, continuous integration environment. Um, we've been doing dashboards here, you know, before uh, CI was even a word. Um, which I think is one of the reasons uh, BTK became such a popular toolkit is, you know, early on we discovered that, uh, you know, if you didn't test stuff, it was usually broken. And there was also a big move in the, uh, in GE to do uh, Six Sigma at the time, um, where they basically had everyone in the whole company had to take Six Sigma training. Six Sigma was a manufacturing process for uh, Make, get, getting your errors in the uh, six sigma of the uh, um, curve. And we all had to take this and it's thinking maybe we could do something useful and get some of, you know, even at G Research where there was basically a lot of papers being written and throwaway code, maybe we could turn this into something useful and created uh, the idea of things you could measure on the dashboard. So what can you measure with uh, Compiling, well, you can do style checking. Um, you can uh, count the number of uh, errors for configures or warnings, build errors and warnings, um, tests passing and release tests failing and passing. Um, C Dash works with other CI tools. Um, it can work with Jenkins, BuildBot, uh, GitLab CI, um, or just C-Test scripts and cron jobs, Circle CI, Travis, um, and I think C-Dash provides something that these other tools um, are somewhat lacking on um, in the fact that, like, Jenkins, <laughs> if you have something fail or a test fail, then what ends up happening is you get a pointer to a build log, which might be pages and pages and pages of text, and somewhere in there is the error, um, whereas C-Dash not only provides a way of parsing those errors and, and a clean interface to them, but allows you to uh, search for relevant results. So in this case here, I'm looking for all the sites that contain Microsoft in the group Nightly Expected, and I'm looking for test failures greater than zero. So it's showing me all the uh, sites from Microsoft that have test failures. And this also allows us to see a good example of something C-Dash is doing. 
So like I mentioned before, Microsoft is building CMake. Distributing CMake is part of their, their tool set. So they're actually testing CMake nightly on their systems and providing that information to the CMake developers through CDATCH. Um, I can compare results across systems. So I can look and see that uh, for KWSYS test console buffer, um, that it was only failing on these two systems, but on these uh, other systems it was passing. Um, I can also track test timing. So you can see this test um, normally takes hardly any time, and then suddenly on uh, September 13th, it, uh, its execution time went up to uh, 11 seconds. Um, and that can be uh, an indication of something something going wrong, and it can see that can send you an alert when this happens. So if your code suddenly gets slower, um, it's probably something you want to know about. Um, CDASH has sub-project support um, for larger and more complex projects. Um, the Trillionos package uses this. And the idea is that we've got our main project, Trillinos, and you can see for that project there was one error and a bunch of warnings, and this is actually a, uh, you know, the, the full build here. But then we can break it down into sub-projects. So if I'm a uh, Tepos developer, I can look at it and say, nope, not my problem. Um, there are, none of the errors are, are in my part of the system. Um, so it, it allows the developers to look at the, the part of the system that they care about and to get things fixed quicker. C-dash queries, so in this one, um, I'm showing uh, all the ones with the build name heavy for the past two weeks. So that's a pretty useful way of looking back in time and, and seeing what, what things have been doing over time. You know, often oftentimes, Code will creep into a code base, you know, maybe it'll get past your CI, the initial CI, and something will start failing. But then you can go back to these dashboards and, and figure out when when things started going awry and when the test started failing. And then go back and figure out exactly which version of the code started causing the problem. Um, you can do uh, most expansive tests. Uh, it looks like, so this one's showing most expensive tests uh, yesterday. So build time is after two days ago. Um, build time is before one day ago. And then uh, I'm sorting based on time. And I can see that, uh, you know, which, which of my tests is taking most of the time. And that's useful for getting your uh, test cases down to something smaller. Um, C-Test also has uh, command wrappers output, so if uh, you can actually see the actual command line that was run and the standard error um, instead of just doing log scraping. Um, coverage display, um, we do GCOV, um, various formats of that, a uh, commercial tool called Bullseye, um, and the idea is you can see your coverage and be able to drill down to each file and see which lines of codes are covered and, and do various uh, viewings of, of that. You can also uh, support integrating Dahlgren Purify memory checkers, um, the runtime checkers, and it will show uh, an initialized memory reads, potential memory leaks. And the idea here is that you really want to run these tests every night, right? A lot of folks I know that, you know, they'll run um, some sort of memory checker when, you know, Valgrind, when, when their code's doing something funny or they suspect something's wrong. Um, but usually that's too late. This, this you could run it, you know, every night on your code base and it would catch it, the uh, bad code, much more quickly and also point to which, which checking caused the problem, which makes it easier to find. C dash supports the display of uh, image differences. Um, this is up to the project to actually you know, compute the image difference, but 
CDAFs can support uh, showing the, the image differences. The other tool that we have uh, in the, the suite is called CPAC. And CPAC is also bundled with CMake. And it creates installers, like uh, WYSIWYG installers on Windows, um, drop and drag installer on the Mac. It can create just a plain targz file. Um, on Windows, we do Wix and Nullsoft. Mac can do OSX, uh, drag and drop, or the package maker. Can also do Debian and uh, RPM packages. So it's a way of basically using your uh, install commands. So basically, CPAC piggybacks off of your install commands. So to get it to work with CPAC, you make sure your install works and your code works out of an install tree and your executables work with relative paths and can work from any directory. And then you uh, would set a few CPAC options if needed and then include CPAC and then you would be able to get these uh, installers created for you. So, uh, now that you're inspired, um, you can read how to uh, write a CMake build system by going to the uh, manual online, um, which we update all the time. Um, you can explore the CMake documentation. And thanks for coming to the webinar, and I guess we can uh, open it up for uh, questions and discussion now. Hi, Bill. Thank you. Uh, Ashley, are you going to open the microphone for everybody? or? So I would say at this point, Bill, if you want to share the Google Doc, um, your compadres have been trying very hard to keep up with the questions. Um, but maybe we can uh, start looking at some of the questions and feel free for others to throw your questions in chat. We do have about 100 people on the line, so it's probably not wise for me to open the mic. Um, but you can't raise your hand. Yeah, raise your hand or throw it in this document. Um, but I don't know if there's some questions on there that are still being um, worked on. And then my question, other resources I thought I'd fill out, uh, recipes. So, Bill, we just got a question uh, through chat, which is how is CMake compared to other build tools such as SCONs and GNU Auto Tools? Um, well, CMake is a uh, build generator, so uh, and interestingly enough, uh, SCONS was uh, sort of the, uh, there was a bake-off there when I talked about KDE using uh, CMake. Um, that was the other uh, contender, um, and they ended up going with CMake. I think uh, I haven't used SCONS directly, but the, the, uh, the problem they had in there was that since SCONS was uh, basically Python, um, it had very, uh, each project sort of wrote its own SCONS, so it kind of made it uh, difficult to uh, share code, whereas sort of the CMake philosophy is the hard stuff's done in C++, and once it's done there, it's shareable by everybody. Um, and I mean, I think the big, so that's that's one of the differences there, um, and that CMake allows you to use you know native build tools, um, and you know we we were able to take advantage of Ninja and you know or you know people that want to use Visual Studio or um, other other types of uh, IDEs can use it directly from CMake, um, and I think CMake also has this uh, other rich set of uh, testing tools, um, package import and outport um, of the uh, Target files, so it has a, I think, in a, in a better way of linking in um, external packages. Um, a lot of that's been thought out in the install rules. Um, as far as auto tools, I mean, I think that CMake does have a lot of features. I think that that I went over today that that may be hard to do in auto tools, but the, you know, obviously one of the the big ones that auto tools it basically depends on having a whole Unix environment, and if you ever want to go somewhere else that doesn't have one, um, you know, Windows or, or some other system, it might not might not have that. So, Bill, a few more questions have come in, um, and so 
you may see in here, but have you noticed CMake bills being significantly larger than the auto tools? In HDF5, the difference is enormous. Not sure if that's inherent to CMake or a problem with our bill script. Let's show you what they mean by large. Is file size, like probably binary size? Sorry, if the person who asked that question wants to uh, chime in, feel free to take yourself off mute. Yeah, we see enormous ones. You guys hear that? The binary size is large? Yeah, the, 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 well, the, when we build, like if, if we have a, a, an outer source built for the auto tools, it's significantly smaller. It's like an order of magnitude, which is a problem if you have a system that's like doing a lot of testing and you're, you're building many things. The, the C deck, the, 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 the C makes up is huge. Um, is that make files or ninja files or? Uh, the auto tool stuff is just make files. Right, but when you're doing C make, which one? Uh, with the target of the auto tool, the build make file. Right. Um, yeah, I, hadn't, I mean, I think usually CMake uh, runs runs does it runs faster, but uh, it's uh, yeah, I haven't hadn't really noticed that one. Um, so I don't. It may be that CMake produces larger uh, a larger footprint, but it shouldn't be. This shouldn't be that much larger. Unless they're cleaning up their object files. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not sure. I'd have to look at that. Uh. Yeah. So, Bill, we've gotten a few questions as we've gone along about um, can you recommend any good resources, reference uh, materials for C make? Yeah, it's different which one. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I, I referenced that the first. Um, Craig Scott's professional CMake book um, is excellent. And so. Uh, we'll make sure we get form, It's only in electronic form currently. I don't know if you have any intentions on doing um, a paper version since he wants to keep it up to date with newer versions of CMake. Thank you. Um, and there's some other ones coming in down there, Bill. I don't know if you can see them. Yep. Developing tools help with cross compilation on HPC systems. Yeah, right? Ah, <laughs> uh, the cross compiling for HPC systems. Um, Right, so that would be like for us, our work with the SPAC team for better CMake integration. Uh, but that's not cross compilation. No, right, well. So, Bill, at this point, we. We only have a couple of minutes left, and I know there's still lots of questions coming in. So for those folks on the phone, we will continue to answer any questions that come in throughout this webinar in this document, and we will be sending a copy of this video along with the completed question and answers um, to all the people who registered for this webinar. Um, so keep your questions coming in, but I think at this point it would probably be uh, we could completed slide and, and that will give Bill and team time to kind of really address these questions uh, more comprehensively and get those answers to you as, um, in the next few days. So then, so so I, I, yep, yep. So let me just then um, show my last slide here. So uh, as Ashley mentioned, so the uh, presentation, the slides, and also the recording of this uh, 
webinar is going to be available soon. I, uh, we have that arrow, uh, uh, so if you'd like to have to give us some feedback about this webinar, please feel free to do so. And also, if you'd like to uh, have further training or CMake, I think we can uh, help with that. So please fill the survey, and in particular, the question number six in that survey. That's the field where you could give us some, uh, you know, if you'd like to have further training on CMake. I also take the opportunity to announce the next webinar that's going to be about a month from today, and it's going to be Open Source Best Practices from Continuous Integration to Statical Interest by Daniel Smith and Ben Pritchard from the Molecular Institute of Software, funded by NSF. And that's the link, xscaleproject.org slash event slash CI2SL, where you can, uh, can find more information about that uh, webinar and also register if you are interested. With that, thank you very much. Thank you, the speakers. Thank you all for, for, for attending the webinar. Thanks. Thank you, Bill. Thank you um, for all of you who were helping to answer the questions in the Google Doc. Um, I'm going to uh, close the webinar. It won't kick you out. Um, but remember, feel free, if we didn't get your question answered, to put it in the Google Doc so that we can make sure we get you an answer and I just want to echo what Ozzy said. We are looking at working with Bill and team to develop some additional training. Um, it's really important that you could let us do in that survey really what specifically you would like to learn more about. That will really help us as we move forward in the next month developing some additional training. Thank you all for your time. Have a great day. And we'll hopefully see you next month. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Ozzy. Thanks. Sure. Thank you.